Sometimes I know exactly who he is and other times he feels like a complete stranger. Oh. Hello my friends, this is Ro. Welcome back to my channel. Today I'm going to teach you more about prison life and prison wife life using scenes from the popular show on ABC called For Life. This was episode four and it was called Marie. So basically it is all about the prison wife in the show. So if you're interested in learning more about prison life, prison wife life, and the show For Life, that's a lot of life in one little statement. Please keep watching. If you're new here, my name is Ro. I am the founder of an organization called Strong Prison Wives and Families, the author of a book called The Comeback Code. I'll pop a link to it right up there. I use my years of experience to help prison wives and family members. We do not glorify, we do not glamorize prison life, prison, prison wife life, or anything of the sort here. Frankly, the whole entire thing is really painful and it sucks. So what I'm gonna do is show you how to make the best of this one-shot deal. Please do me a favor and give this video a thumbs up. It's really, really helpful to me in YouTube. Also subscribe and ding that bell so you're the first to know when I post a new video every Monday, Wednesday, Friday. So many of you guys are fighting over to be the first comment and it's just so fun. I feel so loved by you guys from all of the support and the comments and everything like that. So please know that I read every single one that I see. If I don't respond to you, it's only because I just genuinely got busy and couldn't get through all the comments or YouTube didn't show me a notification. So the episode starts off with Marie kind of having a panic attack in the car. The week before this, she went to visit her life or husband who's serving an unjust sentence in prison and she brings him his police file that a cop wasn't supposed to, but he dropped off to her. She hands it to him. He's like, Marie, this could be it. This could be the thing that gets me home. And she hands it to him. She runs out of visit when it's over. She gets to the car and she was like, oh, what is happening? And I feel that with my whole entire heart and soul because he's like, this could be the thing that gets me out. And she's thinking it could be, but it also could not be. And she is so afraid to hold on to that because it's also very crushing when you finally stick your neck out and you finally hold on to something and you finally grasp at something that could get you your life back. After so many years of things not working out and the government being against you and unfair trials and denied appeals and things coming through the system, you get so close that you could basically grab it and they deny all of it. I'm there right now, unfortunately. In 2016, we got word that Adam's clemency petition was sitting on the vice president's desk. He was getting ready to look at it, send it over to the president, and we literally ran out of time. And that's one of probably five or six things that's happened to us since 2011 when criminal justice reform started to kind of hit the scene. And it's just really hard, you guys. Now that clemency is coming back around, I have to keep it at arm's length. I can't get attached, but then how do you not get attached? You always have to keep hope. And it's this weird, just, it's just a weird feeling. It's just an awful feeling because you want to hold on to hope, but you also don't want to get that hope crushed or yourself crushed. You just have to protect your heart and your feelings. The next part is when Marie starts saying she always felt she was safe and secure. She always felt like she had time. There was always going to be time in the future for her to do what she needed to do. And they showed a few scenes where the first one, she was handed a letter from one of the doctors at the chemo hospital that she worked for where they were recommending her to go to nursing school. They said she'd be so good at it and she brought it home. She's like, I don't even know if I want to do that. She put their daughter Jasmine first. She put her husband's business first. He always wanted to buy these clubs. She got behind him and she neglected herself. And I don't think that's a prison wife thing. I think a lot of times that's a mommy thing. That's a wife thing. That's a woman thing. And this situation really illustrated to her that there isn't always going to be time for everything. Her life got turned completely upside down, just like every other prison wife that's dragged into this as well. I was also watching another show on Netflix called When They See Us. It's about the Central Park Five, the five little boys that were wrongfully accused of taking the life of a jogger in Central Park in the, I think, early 1990s, maybe late 80s, but I think it was the early 90s. And one of the little boys, he was 15 or 16 at that point, he was in prison and his family came to visit him and his sister was telling this story story about how she was working at, I believe it was some sort of maybe either a car rental company or a vacation home rental company. And this man came in who she had so much chemistry with. They made each other laugh. They had this small exchange. She gave him the keys to the car or home that he was renting from 
the company she was working for. And she said for days, she looked forward to going to work because she didn't know what day he was gonna come back and return that key. She so looked forward to work those three days because she wanted to see that guy. And when he finally came in, they hit it off once again. They were laughing, they were intrigued with each other. They had so much chemistry between the two of them. So he asked her on a date and she thought about it for a second and she said no. So when she's telling her brother, the 15 year old inmate this story, he's like, you said no, what? And she got serious and she said, I said no because I felt guilty having fun while you're in here. You need to find your thing that you look forward to. She said, I looked forward to those days. She said, and I learned that I had to stop, I had to go out, I had to have fun. That's something that every single one of us has gone through, will go through at some point or other in your prison wife journey is that you put yourself in prison with your loved one because you feel guilty celebrating, you feel guilty smiling, you feel guilty being with your family on the holidays or being out on New Year's Eve or insert whatever was a big deal for you and your loved one while he or she is in there miserable, rotting in a jail cell. I had a woman say that to me one time, while he's rotting. I said, he's not rotting. He does not have a skin eating disorder or disease. We need to keep ourselves positive and he or she wanna know that you're out here and you're living your life. So in this case, what Marie does is she does go back to nursing school and at one point she brings her daughter Jasmine into a visit, one of her first visits when she's really young and she just watches Jasmine and her father behind the glass have an amazing exchange and it was beautiful and if you can bring your babies to visit so they can develop whatever kind of a relationship they can have with their father or mother, whoever the inmate is. So after the visit, they're in the car and Jasmine says to her mother, mom, I don't understand. If he's not guilty, if he shouldn't be here, then why is he here? I thought only bad guys go to jail. And her mother just said, oh, well, there's a little bit of confusion, but don't worry, baby, I've got us right now. I'll take care of us, I got it. And then she holds them down. She puts herself through nursing school and that's, Yes, 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 true for prison wives. We have to wear so many hats. They're ripped away from you. You have to be the one that pays the bills, pays the mortgage, keeps the roof over your head, raises the children. You have to wear the mommy hat, the daddy hat, the disciplinary hat, the having fun hat, playing Santa Claus hat, playing tooth fairy hat, father daughter dance if you go or you have an uncle go or a friend go you have to be the sole provider and that's not just prison wives that's every single mommy out there or a single daddy out there you hold it down and you're amazing at that first visit when marie goes to visit aaron for the first time they do a flashback and there's this older woman in the cubby next to her because it's county visits before he gets sent to state prison it's behind glass and he's on one side of the glass, she's on the other side of the glass, and they communicate through a phone, and there's little teeny tiny walls around them, and it's this long row of women in the chairs and long row of inmates, and everyone's separated just by kind of like little tiny cubbies. I'll put a picture up there if I can find it. And this woman across from her, she's in the next cubby down, she's kind of talking her through it. I don't remember if she says something like, you have to pick up the phone, you have to do this. And that's something that's absolutely true. When it's your first time at visit, usually veteran visitors that have been there before will take you under their wing and they'll just kind of show you the ropes. So for you guys that are really nervous, that you don't know what you're gonna have to do the very first time you go to visit, if you say it's my first time visiting or you say it's my first time at this new facility, somebody will step up and help you. So then another thing that happens is that Aaron's co-defendants all rolled on him. They all blamed what they were doing on him. They framed him. 100% that's true, that happened to Adam. That's all I have to say about that. Then he's going to trial while well, he's preparing for trial and Marie and Aaron are sitting with his attorney and his attorney's asking him if he wants to take the plea. And Aaron says, no, I'm not taking the plea. I'm not copying to something that I didn't do. And Marie looks at him and she's like, but you're looking at life. And he said, but I didn't do it. And she's like, but you're looking at life. Just say you did it. And he said, absolutely not. Like that goes against everything that I believe in. I'm innocent and I'm gonna fight for it. And it's his life, he gets to choose, but just like many, many, many other people, like Adam, they exercised their right to go to trial and they got punished. Because just because you have a right to go to trial in the United States, very often, if you don't go along with the government's plan and you don't plea, 
to what they tell you you want they want you to plea to you're going to be punished for going to trial you're going to get the book thrown at you and unfortunately it's hard to beat these cases the jury will never know how much time that somebody is facing on purpose i learned that like just a few years ago with adam's case somebody came back from his jury and said if i knew how much time that man was looking at, I never would have convicted him of being guilty. He doesn't deserve 213 years. Just like Aaron, maybe somebody on their jury, on his jury, wouldn't have convicted him of life. So it skews their decisions based off of him actually being guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. Now it's, he's probably not guilty, but he could do five years. Or he could be guilty, but he might not be guilty, and now I'm sentencing him to life. Once that sentence is handed down, they flash to a scene of Marie in the bathroom of the courthouse, and she's sobbing, and she's vomiting, and she's crying, and she's on the floor, and she's having this major meltdown. Sadly, yeah, of course that's true for women having to experience their husband being sentenced, whether he's guilty or not. When you hear, like it reminds me of when Mike Sorrentino was sentenced to, from the Jersey Shore, was sentenced to eight months watching his roommates, which it kind of makes me laugh. All respect, I love them, but it was eight months and they were acting like it was the end of the world. I, it's all relative, I get it. Losing your freedom for a day is too long, but Adam and I kind of joke about it because it was eight months. That's all I'm gonna say. But watching their reactions, I, it's, it's excruciating to lose the person you love. At another point during this episode, all of the visitors are lined up to be processed to go into visiting and then a cop walks up the line. Ironically, I, I'm pretty sure she also plays a cop in Orange is the New Black, but she's like, visiting is canceled due to lockdown and Marie says, why? Obviously she's just throwing it out there. She's just reacting in real time. She's like, why? The lady's like, you know I can't tell you that. Like, basically knock it off or there's going to be a problem. Get out. Yes, of course, that happens very frequently. Visits canceled. You're there. You flew across the country, maybe from a different country, and something happens. There's a fight that breaks out. They go on lockdown. There was actually a visit not too long ago. I wasn't at, but my friend was. They told me that the facility went on lockdown during visit, and the visitors were escorted out mid-visit. Happened one time where Adam's mom drove 12 or 14 hours with her sister. His dad wound up mixing up the weekend and he went the exact same day, drove 12 or 14 hours. They were around from the same area as each other. And they were, they just so happened to meet up in the parking lot and found out that visit was canceled. And she started, his mom started sobbing and breaking down in the parking lot because I think this was the first time that she was gonna see her son after he was convicted and serving a life sentence for a few robberies. But I think the story goes, I wasn't there, I wasn't back in Adam's life yet, but I think the story goes that his father pulled out a bottle of tequila for them to all do a shot and his mom was like, you're gonna get us all arrested. We're on federal property, get me away from this man. So that's just a little funny story that Adam tells me, but it's heart-wrenching. It's happened to me, I think once in all the years that I've been doing this, that I was actually at the facility and found out that it was canceled. Prior to that, there's been quite a few times where I am planning to go to visit, I don't hear from him, I call, I find out from a friend, the facility is actually on lockdown and my visit get can gets canceled. At one point I was, a friend of mine was gonna fly up from Florida and go to visit with me and that it wasn't able to happen. So for me, it's really nothing. For her, she lost out on a plane ticket. Okay, there's another scene where Adam, Adam I keep calling Aaron Adam, are you kidding me? <laughs> you know who's on the top of my mind. So in another scene, Aaron's father says to Marie, you're letting him become a lawyer? This must be when he first started to go to law school. And she was like, yeah, he could do whatever he wants to do. It's his hope. And he was like, you think being a lawyer is giving him hope? And she said, let him have his hope, it's all that he has. Yes, 100% facts, true. Hope is all that they have in there. There have been some things with Adam that he says and I'm like, uh, oh. And then I just remind myself, I cannot get emotionally involved or invested in what he was saying. I have this whole video that I made on Christmas one year. I'll post it up in the cards about being institutionalized and how he used to drag me into these kind of like hope-filled fantasies. And he'd be like, oh, this is great. I'm gonna be out by the end of this year. And 
I would take that as fact because Adam's a very bright person. He has a lot of experience. So I'm like, well, he knows better than me, but I didn't realize it was him grasping onto hope. So that's, that's how he survives in there. That's fine. I'm not going to crush his hope, but I also had to learn how to distance myself from his hope. But yeah, hope is all that they have in there. And Adam has this saying, as long as there is breath, there's hope. Meaning as long as you are breathing, as long as you're alive, there is a glimmer of hope in your life, even in the most desperate situations where you feel like it's just depression and despair, there is hope there. So there's another scene where Marie's going, she's laying down in her bed and she rolls over and she grabs this body pillow and she starts cuddling with it. And it just kind of displays how she's spending nights alone and she doesn't have her person there to cuddle with. And yeah, any prison wife has done that. I, I've cuddled with a body pillow plenty of times just to hold something because it's a lonely, depressing life and you do sleep alone every night and you get used to that, but there are some times that you just need to cry into your body pillow and that's okay. Another part is when, I keep saying Adam for Aaron. Another point is when Aaron's best friend on the street, his name is Darius. Marie is, I'm laughing because I keep calling Aaron Adam. So Aaron's best friend from the street, Darius, is having a conversation with Marie and she's pissed about something he did. I wanna say it's that he had an illegal cell phone, but I don't remember exactly. I watched the show a week ago and I know this video is posting late, but that's okay. She's like, why would he be doing that? And he said, well, he's doing it because he's doing what he has to do to survive in there. And that is 100% the God's honest truth. Sometimes they have to do what they have to do to survive in there. Now, I don't want that to be misconstrued. That doesn't mean just doing illegal stuff. That doesn't mean using people for money because he just has to survive in there. That means maybe carrying food out of the chow hall. That's not, they're not supposed to do, but it's that or starve. That means maybe negotiating a deal with somebody to trade something for something else because he needs pickles for a recipe and the other guy needs chips or he gets cookies in his free Christmas bag and Adam wants the nuts because he doesn't eat cookies so they switch. That's not technically allowed in there but it happens all the time. Aaron had the cop out here do him that favor to get his file in there. He's not supposed to do that but he did it because he was doing what he had to do to survive. So I want you guys to not get confused on the difference between having to do really horrible things just because he has to survive versus there are some times that they have to do things that you just don't need to know about or nitpick on. That's where I'm going to leave that. Just try to know the difference and just have to figure it out one thing at a time. I think I just made that more confusing. So if I did and more questions came from that, just let me know in the comments below and I'll, I'll be happy to elaborate. So then she says in another scene, to Darius again. Sometimes I know exactly who he is and other times he feels like a complete stranger. Oh yes, you guys. This happens really often very early on in a sentence where a man or a woman who's been arrested and is incarcerated has to kind of shut off the outside world and they have to learn how to live inside of life. You have to learn how to live as a convict. You have to start shutting off your emotions. You have to start disconnecting from the outside world because it's really hard to do time when you have a foot in the street and a foot inside of prison. Adam told me when I first came back into his life, he said, I've been living in a high security prison for so many years. He was about a decade in at that point. He said, this is really hard for me. He said, I shut myself off to the outside world because it's how I knew how to do time. Let me stop myself. A lot of times there's guilt associated with dragging you through this. There's shame because of what they did and getting caught and all of that stuff. So if you feel like they're pushing you away, then know that that happens to 100% of the people that I've coached, 100% of the people, every single person that I've coached that was with their loved one before they were incarcerated has experienced this at some point within the first six weeks to six months of the journey. So going back to Adam, he said, you know, this is really hard for me because now I have to figure out how to teeter both of these worlds outside society that I shut myself off of for so long and also this inside world. It's difficult, but I love it. I don't want that to go away because risking, feeling uncomfortable and imbalanced and having to stretch myself and understand what that outside world and kind of have a, a taste of that outside world again 
even though I have no relief in sight, it's so worth it to be with you. But it also ignited hope for him to come out here again one day. It softened him. It allowed him not to become a hardened criminal who's like, I have nothing left to lose because I'm a lifer and I know nothing but this prison society. I know how to do time. I can do hard time if I need to. All right, I'm getting lost in a tangent, but Oof, it just got me emotional. Okay, the next one is Marie asks Aaron for a divorce at visit at some point. And yeah, that's very common. And I'm not judging anybody if it's time for you to exit this relationship. You have a choice, not only from day one, if you're gonna stay and do this bid, every single morning when you wake up, you get to decide, am I gonna stay or am I gonna go? Have I had enough of prison wife life? Why do I preach that all the time? Because that empowers you to say, I decided to do this. Nobody's holding a gun to my head and making me stay in this relationship. When you're empowered and you look at it like that, this is my choice. When things get rough and things get hard and you get depressed, then you remember this is my choice. And if in five years you wake up and you're like, no, I just can't hold on anymore. I'm done. I need to live my life. Life is passing me by. And he still has 30 more years. He still has two more years and I don't want to do it. There is no judgment here. You have my utmost support to listen to your heart and do what you have to do. It might just be a conversation where you say, I love you and I wanna to be together, but we need to open our relationship up and I wanna see other people as well. Okay, or it might be, I need a divorce. I can't do this anymore. My advice to you is have an open, honest communication with your loved one. And the one thing that you have to do is to be honest. The minute you start lying and covering stuff up is going to be the demise of any relationship, especially a prison, well, no, any relationship, period. So the next one is that at one point at Marie's birthday party, she winds up hooking up with Darius and you could tell like he doesn't want to do it. He's trying to avoid her. She had a couple of drinks. Everybody else leaves and they just wind up kissing. He gets a little bit odd and uncomfortable and he winds up like uncomfortably leaving the situation. But yeah, I mean, think about that. That's just human nature when you're going through grief. A lot of women find comfort in another man's arms. A lot of times his boys on the street or even his boys inside are going to go after his girl. <laughs> that is so not right, but it happens. The last thing I want to leave you with is what the show ended with. And it was Marie. And she was saying, I used to think my life was blessed. And then for a really long time, I thought it was cursed and now I don't know day to day. That summarizes prison wife life in one straight to the point, look at my chills, one straight to the point line. Some days you feel like your old life, you were blessed and you took advantage of it and you took it for granted. Then throughout all of this, you're like, I'm cursed. Hell, clemency's coming and now they're talking about President Trump who's in his 70s could have been exposed to the coronavirus. You don't think I'm going, oh my God, what happens if he gets it and he can't pull through? Because the rug's just been pulled out for me so many times and every time we get really close, it seems like it's ripped away. So yeah, of course, sometimes I think we're cursed and I have a black cloud and every time we get right there, it's pulled away. And then another thing good will happen and then something bad will happen. So day to day, genuinely don't know. So you have to be a really strong individual and you have to be able to not just grasp for claw at the positive to be able to get yourself through this. Marie is one strong ass woman. I am a tough Jersey girl and you, my friend, you're very strong too. You guys keep staying strong, keep loving strong, keep supporting one another through this journey because you're one day closer to it all being over. Lots of love from my heart to all of yours. I'll see you beautiful ladies and gentlemen in the next one. Bye guys.